As I said, the bookkeeper and controller will focus more on the past. CFO will come in and focus more on the future. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business podcast, a project of the PTEX Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the PTEX headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, this is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Pinchas Engel. Pinchas is the founder of Pinit Bookkeeping, a firm dedicated to helping established e-commerce sellers. Pinchas' main mission is to give his clients clear insights into their finances, turning complex data into simple, actionable strategies. With a knack for making numbers make sense, he's helped many clients boost their profits. In our conversation, I discussed with Pinchas the viral relationship between CFOs and marketing officers. We also discussed how aligning financial strategies with business objectives can propel your business forward. And when is the time to consider hiring a dedicated financial role like bookkeeping, controllers, and CFOs. We discussed the importance of understanding the, the unique challenges e-commerce sellers are facing. And Pinchas shares insights on managing complex data, tracking inventory costs, and the importance of understanding key financial metrics is important to reveal effective strategies for thriving in a competitive market. Since Pinchas is building his own company, we discuss the significance of delegation and building a strong team. This and so much more only on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Let's get right to our conversation with Pinchas Engel. Pinchas, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Sure. So, um, you know, for our listeners, we're familiar with the show. Um, On an ongoing basis, we have all kinds of guests. And because it's a business show, um, finance is an important part as well. And we try to bring up every every couple of, of seasons and every couple of episodes, somebody that will speak about finances, because a business without finance at one point will fail. You could have the best product, you can have the best marketing, you have the best sales, best operations. But if the finances don't match up at one point, it's going to go under unless you have, you have somebody that's infusing cash in the business. So it's an important uh, point. I know that you focus a lot on e-commerce, but we'll get to it. So for our listeners that don't know anything about you, tell us a little bit about what you do and a little bit how you got into this business. Okay, sure. So I run today a a bookkeeping slash CFO firm. So it's two separate types of services. We can get into it soon. I run specifically for e-commerce businesses, but that happened, uh, you know, throughout, throughout the time I started out, you know, working with any small business that just wanted to outsource their bookkeeping and they didn't want to take care of it on their own. With time, we niched down specifically for e-commerce. We had a few e-commerce sellers. We had a few other industries. And uh, we noticed there was a lot of opportunity for us to go more deep into e-commerce. So we work specifically with them, specifically with established e-commerce businesses. So they have a lot going on. Uh, doing a couple million in sales a year and up. Our average is usually sellers are doing between five to 35 million in sales. Um, And yeah, we take over their financial side of the business. We help them on on a lot of different angles, mainly on number one, having 100% true accurate reports, which is not the easiest thing in e-commerce given uh, so many details. Second of all, to have a good uh, strategy in place with how they run their finances. So there's a lot to be done. And uh, third of all, we work with them to understand their numbers and to you know, really get to understand their business from a numbers point of view so they can make better decisions day to day and figure out where they can unlock more profit, more cash flow, and ultimately grow their business to a higher level. Nice. Interesting that you mentioned that you focus on e-commerce. Um, I recently met uh, with somebody that does a similar service that you do. And right from the get-go, he told me that I, I work with all kinds of service businesses, but not e-commerce. See, obviously, there, there's room for everybody. So so t- talking about that, what would you say is the is the unique set of challenges e-commerce sellers have when it comes to finances in general? Okay, number one, there's a lot of data that's not in your hands. So let's say you sell on Amazon. There's a lot happening, right, on your sales side on Amazon. They're collecting your money, they're getting all the sales, and then they're paying out 
to you. So it's not like a traditional business that they're generating their own invoice and putting out the customer's name and they have all the information. There's a lot happening on the marketplace and there's a lot of different data points. Amazon is pretty complex when it comes to how they pay you, what they pay you, what they're taking off, what their fees are. So being able to get the true information of what's happening on your marketplace into your accounting system is one unique challenge. Second of all, they're just dealing with inventory. So any inventory business is more uh, complicated than a service-based, given that you want to act, you want to have it in, on your reporting in the accurate way. So you don't want to just look at inventory when you buy them. If you want to look at the true profitability of a company, you want to analyze them based on your sales. So if you sold X amount of money, you want to know what that inventory cost was. So tracking inventory, knowing the true cost of good of it, the landed cost, given that they're bringing it from overseas, there's a lot of different fees related to the actual inventory. All of that make it more complicated to know your true inventory number, and then you buy it at different rates, at different cost. So being able to get the inventory accurate in your financial system is probably you know the second uh, uniqueness to there. And then just being able to bring it all together in, in a timely way with so much information uh, makes it you know more complicated. Now, let me ask you, um, this is something that I've, I've shared on the podcast many times, and, and this is something I've seen, um, hopefully it's changing to the better, where business owners, anytime you'll ask them like some sort of financial question, they'll turn to their uh, bookkeeper, they'll turn to their accountant. Ask they'll say, you know, to ask him. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think that's, that's a, a very big mistake because there is business owners that need to have the certain metrics that they need to know in their sleep. You know, those are the key metrics and, you know, some people call it scorecard numbers, whatever that is. These are these are things that that you need to know because these these are moving the needle forward or keeping the business flat or actually in a negative. Right. From from your perspective, um, what are the key components a business owner needs to know outside of whoever they, they use? outside bookkeeping services such as yours, or they have in-house bookkeeping service, they have accountants, and we could soon speak a little bit more about how the field has evolved. But what would you say is some some the non-negotiable numbers that and metrics that a business owner needs to have? Right. So it's a very good point that you're bringing it up because I would say one of my main focuses as a CFO working with these clients is I don't want them to rely on me, on their numbers, to know, you know what's going on in the business. I want to I want to communicate it back to them and I want them to own it more than me. It's their business. So that's a very good point and, and it's one of the main focuses. So when it comes to an e-commerce business, and it's true across the board, is you know there's two main costs in a company. There's the investment side of a company, meaning whatever you sell, if it's a product or service, you have to spend money on that product or on that service. If it's people doing for you the service, or if it's you're buying uh, you know, goods and selling it. So that's the cost, and we can call the cost of the sale. And then there's the support cost where everything around what you need to have in a business to operate. So the number one uh, you know, metric you wanna know as a business is, what's my return on that investment? If that return is very low, it's gonna be extremely hard for you to scale, and it's gonna be extremely hard for you to you know, pay for all the support around of that of that support. If you have a high return on that investment, meaning you know you don't have to spend too much on your inventory upfront and it brings you back a nice amount of sale and there's room for profit and for your other costs, that allows the business to scale much quicker without running out of cash. So I would say number one is the return on investment. So specifically in the e-commerce business, it will be their cost of good, what's their investment on the item and what's their return. Every business, we can go on what's the right return, but that's more uh, specific for a business to figure out what that number you know, should be. And at different stages in the company, it changes. So that would be the number one uh, metric I would look at, return on the investment. And the second would be uh, profitability. So the return on the profitability, which could be two different things, would be the two main uh, numbers. Got it. Now, in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, we know different businesses have different stages. So you could have companies that are on the growth stage where gross prof, gross uh, um, sales is more important than profit. Obviously, it should never be more important than profit. But uh, you know, they're looking to gain market share in a certain category. How do you advise people when it comes to that? Uh, 
the chick know the egg. If I don't have sales, I don't have profit. If I don't have market share, I don't have profit. How do you advise people? Is, is it a difference in where they are in their journey as far as the e-commerce business? Right. So it's interesting because I recently read um, from the CFO of Google that he wrote or she, I'm not sure who it was, wrote an article that um, one of the things they changed in the last year or two is they started focusing that their revenue should go- grow quicker than their, their expenses. So they started focusing a lot on their net cash flow, what's actually remaining on the cash. But they didn't focus on that up until recently, meaning for them it was more about, as you explained, the growth of the company. Are they hitting the right customers? Are they gaining a lot of uh, popularity in, in different sectors? So it, it's a very unique uh, question to a unique uh, situation. But what I want to do with, uh, with specifically a business is to understand that strategy and that end game. So how long are you planning to invest X amount of money without you know, focusing on your profitability? What's that entire investment going to look like? And at what point are you going to start on uh, focusing on gaining a profit? Because that's an investment period. So it needs to make sense towards an end goal. So if it makes sense on the overall picture, and as you go along, you're hitting those targets that you want within the strategy, then you know, that, that makes sense. Now, we know that e-commerce um, has boomed through COVID and ultimately have, have came down. Um, and, and unfortunately, we have seen a lot of Amazon sellers in particular have gone out of business. What would you say is the, is the main cause to what, from, 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 from a financial perspective, what we've seen happening? Right. So there was two things that I saw happening. Number one is um, people were buying inventory based on a different level of sales. You know, during COVID, there was a lot more customer spending, so you had a lot more sales um, going on in your account. So you know, you, you were seeing that you're moving a certain product, 2,000 pieces a month. Then when you reordered, you made you, know, you made your calculations based on that. A lot of people ended up with a lot of extra uh, stock. Actually, you know, a lot of inventory was um, just sitting on the side, and they and sales were coming down, and they didn't have where to put that inventory. And that you know costs a lot to carry from storage to um, just having your cash tied up. So that was one big challenge I saw, and how you know to maneuver that was quite complicated. You know each one, uh, each business had their own way of needing to do it or got stuck with it. Um, second of all, the the fees were changing, and recently there's been you know a lot of conversation about it. How Amazon started charging for more services that they offer and different fees. So it became harder to, to make that profit that they used to make and with more competition. So that's that's the challenging side of it. Mm-hmm. What would you say um, the companies that are surviving this, this round, let's call it, uh, what are you seeing them doing better? Right. So the, the two things is what we spoke a little bit about before on the return on investment. The less money needs to be tied up in the investment side of the business, meaning the less you need to invest in your inventory, the less cash is tied up, the more room you have for anything that goes wrong. So the very successful e-commerce brands have a very high return on their product. So call it a prof, product profit. So let's say they you know, they buy their product for $20, and if they can sell it for 100 which is five times, that's a very nice number, and it gives them a lot of room for all the fees and all the increases. And if container goes up and costs, you know, and, the, and their product is costing them, they have room for it. So number one was the return on investment. And I think it's not spoken enough about that uh, financial aspect. A lot of people are looking at profit at the end of the game when you can have two businesses with the same profitability, but one has a much higher cost of good and the other one has a much lower. The lower one will be able to survive through a lot of different challenges. And they'll be able to invest more and be able to handle you know, challenges versus the one with a high cost of good. It's not going to have that uh, ability. So that would be um, number one. And number two is uh, a lean operations. A regular business, they focus on, on running and operating, you know, by having the right people in place. Staffing is a big, a big conversation. What I've seen in the e-commerce world is the most lean you can be, the better you're, the better you're at. So the least amount of people on your staff, the most amount related to performance. So you're paying based on what performing and what's not performing. And logistics, people have come up with a lot of creative ideas how to avoid 
you know, just paying a lot of money carrying the inventory. So a high return on investment, lean operations gives you gives you a lot of uh, room for challenges and, and making it happen. Yeah, I think I think what we've seen a lot, especially when it was a little bit more, um, you know, when e-commerce was had a little bit of more of a, there was a hype around it, especially through COVID, and people were thinking that okay, retail is not coming back and it's all e-commerce. And there was a lot of banks and a lot of loans being given to the space. And what people don't realize is factoring in your interests and everything else. So if you have, if you don't have your ROI planned out and you're tying up cash and the cash, you're actually paying money to actually have the cash, you actually, you know, you're losing twice in the process. Not only that you're tying up money, you're tying up money and you're paying for that money. Right. And the same is with inventory. When people say, I have to move warehouses because I have to have place for all this inventory. Now you're not factoring in that your your rent went up, um, you know, twice as much as it was in the past. And now every piece of goods that goes out from your inventory actually has to consume some of that uh, rent, con- you know, expense. Right. The carrying cost of inventory is, could be high. I've seen that, you know, a lot of people don't get one. Let's say when it comes to a point, should I get rid of my inventory? Shouldn't I get rid of my inventory? And they're looking and they're looking to see what can I get for my inventory. They don't realize how much they're, even if they're not getting as much as they thought they all get, they're actually losing it in the process. Right. All of a sudden their interest expense went up and they're like, why is my interest so high? You know, and then it's hard to bring it down because you're stuck with the inventory and with that debt. Let me ask you, um, obviously seeing, you know, nobody sees um, e-commerce as much as you see it because you're seeing it in the books and, and you, you always say data doesn't lie. So people can have all kinds of tricks seeing how much they sell on Amazon and how much, how much product they're moving. At the end of the day, data doesn't lie. So if you see the, you see the end of the day, the, the P&Ls and the balance sheets of, of these companies, is there still a, a place where people could get into the e-commerce space and, 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 and be successful? So I think it's like in, in every business, you know, a lot of industries have a ton of competition and there's always new companies coming up. So, you know, when a new company is coming into the market, what's their plan? If they're just trying to be like, you know, another person and, and they don't have the money to invest and in outgrowing that other guy, you know, what are their chances? But if they're coming in with, the, you know, being a little bit different, and, and, you know, there's so many areas where you can be different from your competition. So if they're coming in with a specific plan, how they're going to be able to get customers, what are they going to be able to charge, and are they going to be able to make a profit? I think there is room. I've seen, I've seen newer companies uh, get in and make it happen. So I believe there is room. It's a matter of, uh, you know, are you able to come in at a place where you're going to be able to generate those sales for, with profit? Got it. So I want to touch another subject. Um, you, you mentioned it briefly when we started the introduction about your company. So we find people have bookkeepers, um, people have controllers, people have CFOs, and now there's virtual CFOs, fractional CFOs, whatever you want to call them. Give us a high high level um, understanding of What is the difference between those different positions from a business owner's perspective? What could he expect, he or she could expect differently from those different positions? And ultimately, at which stage of a company do they start needing those different services? Right. So the the three main things when you're thinking about the finance of your company, I think there's three main things that are happening in that domain. There's number one, day-to-day money tasks. So given there's, you know, bills that need to be paid, credit cards that need to be paid, you know, the day-to-day tasks the company has for with their finances. And, you know, you have a lot of transactions going on in your business. So recording them, taking care of your bills, all of that is related to the bookkeeping. You know, the bookkeeper takes care of your day-to-day finances. Um, moving up a level is going to be more on a controller. That would be probably the second step where the controller is the one that understands how a proper uh, profit and loss needs to look like for this business. Is it accurate? Is it not? They see the cash flow from a more broader perspective. They're dealing mainly with the history of the business, the star call data. So making sure it's entered the right way, making sure the reports are coming in the right way, making sure that there is enough cash flow and, and, you know, how the business is operating. Moving up another level where a CFO comes in, 
is going to be more about the future of the business over the past. So, you know, as I said, the bookkeeper and controller will focus more on the past. CFO will come in and focus more on the future. What are those reports telling us about your business? When we look at it, is it, you know, what's the story and what's the information the business owner should be getting out of these reports that will help them make now better decisions moving forward? On a very extreme level, I saw once someone said, CFO needs to be involved in the company to the level where if for some reason the owner has to be out of the business for a year, he should be able to step in and figure out how to get his business back up and running, even without the owner. Meaning he doesn't need to actually know how to get everything done in the company, but he needs to have the understanding of each moving part in the company because each moving part shows up on the profit and loss differently. So if he understands all these moving parts better, what the business strategy is, who are the people that are doing what, um, he should be able to you know, step in and help the company. But he's coming from the financial point of view and you know, supporting the owner in his day-to-day decisions based on more on a numbers point of view. It's interesting that you're saying that because obviously CFO stands for Chief Financial Officer, which is a C-level executive in the leadership team. You know, we obviously, uh, um, uh, being the CEO of Ptex, we we're a branding and marketing agency, and many, many times we have the port that where we say the marketing uh, person wants to do this, the CFO doesn't allow to do it. You know, because they're forward thinking and looking. In the, in the world of business, people say that those two people usually don't get along, and I think it's a myth. Why? Because the CFO should be the first person that wants to spend on marketing. Correct. You know, when he doesn't. When it's not bringing a return on investment. Exactly. So if the marketing person is doing it just for to showcase creativity, of course the, the CFO will stop them. Right. However, if the if the marketing person will say, okay, this is where we want to go as a company and part of with the leadership team, we're going to increase market share, we're going to expand in a different vertical, whatever it is, and the marketing officer comes, this is the plan, this is the agency we're going to be using, that's the be- you know, the best recipe because you have you have the marketing com- agency come in there with their plan. The CFO says, we have the budget for it, and we're going to try, and hopefully we'll be successful. So the only reason when a CFO should not allow to spend the marketing is when there's not a clear um, ROI. And and this should be the case with every um, marketing project. You know, yeah, you know, we love educated clients. You know, people think an agency wants to take advantage from a non-educated client. The, The answer is no. It doesn't work for very long. Right. We love educated clients. When the client will come to us, why do why do I want to rebrand? Why do I want to do the marketing? What's the budget for it? What's the how does success look like? When we have the right answers, it just forces the creativity and forces the creativity in the right way. Because you could sometimes achieve so many diff- the same as the results but different ways in the marketing world. But if you know exactly what the outcome is, what we're expecting, we could then create creatively figure out what's the best way of doing it. So just figure it. That's the beautiful part of when you can get everything to align, meaning, as you just explained, when you can have the CFO who understands you know, the big strategy of the company financially, and you have the CEO who you know has the vision and the ideas where he wants to take his company, and the CFO is like, okay, he understands that vision and understands what it will take and make sure that's a, a healthy way of doing it. And then you have your marketing trying to achieve those goals. Everyone working together, that's the nicest thing to see. Now, in terms of answering the second part of the question, which is at which point, what size of the company does the company need to be? A, first of all, let's go back. Is there a possibility that those people should be, uh, those roles should be within one person? And B, and B, what's the, the, you know, the size or the makeup of a company to start dividing those responsibilities? Right. So it's, it's interesting because you can have an owner I think it depends a lot. We're going to talk about the CFO and then about the bookkeeping. On a CFO level, it really depends a lot on the owner and his skills. So a lot of owners, you know, they're very good at their sales side of the business, figuring out how to sell, who to sell to, and at their product side. But they're completely clueless financially, you know, how to even calculate, you know, basic numbers. That's one level of a business owner. Then you have certain business owners that are very sharp numbers-wise. So... I would I would say that the one that needs you know that it's having a harder time figuring out his numbers on a more basic level will need to bring in such a role such support to his company much earlier in his journey than the other one because the other one will probably make a lot more better decisions going on you know as he's growing his company 
So that's one way how I, I like to look at it. But the second idea is, you know, how much will you gain by being able to, that conversation could be at any point of your business. How much will the business gain as of today if it has the right bookkeeper, the right controller, and the right CFO in place? A lot of small businesses can gain a lot, and a lot of small businesses won't gain a lot, and it doesn't justify the cost of it. So that could be said on the bookkeeping level, on the uh, controller level, and on the CFO. But one thing that I've seen across the board is even if you know your numbers and you understand, well, the owner has a different relationship to his money than an outsider, and they could be doing emotional decisions. Even if they know what's right and wrong, they can deal with their money very differently than an outsider would. And for that alone, having the right person in place, um, you know, just managing your money without the strategy side, more the bookkeeper controller can help the owner, you know, make sure that he's using the money in the right way early on. So I would say business owner has to look into himself and say, you know, am I, am I excelling at my financial side of the business? If not, where's the problem? And he might want to talk to someone that understands it let's say to a CFO, not necessarily someone he's going to hire. You know, this is my business. I have a strong handle on my sales. I have a strong handle on my operations. I'm not sure what needs to happen on the financial side. He wants to get educated and then see uh, what, what kind of support he needs and if it justifies the cost. But if it does, it's, it's a huge uh, return on the investment. Yeah, and today, um, you know, obviously that's that's where services like yours and others come into play. Where sometimes, like in the past, you you needed to hire full time CFO or controller or, or even bookkeeper. Today, you could outsource it and have companies that that provide that service. Um, just just last week, I actually spoke to two partners and had a conversation about the growth of the company. And I, whenever I speak about the growth of the company, I, I like to go back as early as possible of what what brought them together, how they started the company and so on and so forth. And one of the partners just randomly told me, like, I know that you have a podcast and you speak with people and business owners all day long. One thing I could tell you that we have, we, we lost thousands of dollars because I thought I'm going to learn QuickBooks myself and start doing it on the side, like every few hours, a few hours a week. And I'll just do a QuickBooks till I didn't outsource my bookkeeping. Like, like I, I couldn't afford, like I didn't need a full-time bookkeeper, but I outsourced it. And all of a sudden, I started getting reports on a weekly basis, started seeing what my receivables are. And like people were owing me money. People were here. I didn't have cash flow and I was borrowing money when other people were just owing me money and I just didn't allocate the right time for it. Like it's just sometimes the business owners in the beginning, they have so much, so many places where to focus their energy on. And usually financing finance is the last thing on the list. It's just not exciting. And it's probably more complicated and not uh, natural for them. Yeah. And it's also, it's not exciting sales, marketing, re- speaking to another client, getting another vendor on board. These are all exciting parts. So today with resources as bookkeeping services and ultimately even um, fractional CFO services. Right. So bookkeeping is a, a lot more affordable to outsource just so people to understand this. To outsource, even early on in your company, you can, you know, depending on your size, if you're a simple, straightforward business and you're early on, it won't cost you a lot. And as you said, the benefit, you're going to get your reports. You're going to start seeing things in your face that will help you, you know, collect better and manage your money better and, and know what's happening in your business. Fractional CFOs are usually more expensive, given that, it, you know, it's a lot more uh, expertise to it. So that's where um, you want to make sure that it, it makes sense for your company to invest in that. Got it. Now, for our listeners that, you know, most of our listeners are still um, used to listening to the show for the last couple of years through audio. So any of the podcast um, platforms and apps that have audio, we've recently started to push more video. So the people that are actually watching this on video, either on the p website, you can watch the video or on YouTube. There's a beautiful um, poster next to you. It says, what's a good profit margin with a question mark? So I guess I'll ask you that question. Uh, you know, business owners always ask that question, like, what's a healthy profit margin, you know, that I should be aiming for in my business? How do you respond to that? Obviously, you, you can answer depends. Right. <laughs> no, but, but I, I'm going to, right. I have it for a reason. Because I, I like the conversation. I, I want it to be the question. So it's a, it's a question that doesn't come with a straightforward answer. That's why it's there. So we can have a conversation about it. Um, but I'm not going to say depends. <laughs> Okay. 
the way we, we usually think about profit is, you know, how much can I sell it for? What is my cost and what's, uh, what's my profit? Now, usually people don't feel like they have a lot of flexibility in, in, in whatever business they're in, right? If you're running a marketing agency, you need to have people, you know, creating these uh, deliverables that you're doing. So you, you, you have to hire them, you have to pay them. And then if you're into, you know, quality, you need to have quality people and those cost you. So the, the approach that I, I like to, you know, take is we want to start with a price first before your cost. You want to figure out what you what can you charge if it's a product or a service. And you want to look at, you know, the entire market because there's a lot of different types of customers in the marketplace. There are people who are uh, more into, you know, cheap and they don't care so much about quality. There are people who are into, you know, high brands and, and, and you know, luxury and status. So when you're going to start um, your company or whenever you're at your company, you want to start with who are those people and how much can you charge? Then you want to justify the cost and profit from there. So you have to start with a price. So let's say you can charge for a product $100. Now you know, okay, in order for me to operate well and you understand your ROI that you need to have to grow, what could be my cost? And now if you can achieve that, you have a business model. Otherwise, that's not a business model. So a, a good profit margin is one that allows you to grow your company to where you want to. And to achieve that is where you start with price and then price justifies your cost. Nice. Yeah. And that's sometimes when e-commerce in particular, but even other service providers, sometimes your internal cost is so high and your overhead is so high that you're just pricing yourself out of the market. You know, there is still a limit of how much you're allowed to charge for a service. And if you, the more you increase your overhead, the more you actually you're pricing yourself out. And ultimately, even if you're not pricing yourself out, you, you actually, you know, it's eating into your profit margins at the end. Let me ask you, obviously, you're, still, you're also building your own business. Um, and, and you're in a type of business that a lot of people struggle with, where the owner is the, is the, the chief everything officer in the beginning. And, and people connect to you for your knowledge and your way of thinking and your way of looking at books and so on and so forth. And at one point, you have to start delegating. You have to start bringing in a team. What is some, some best practices you have implemented in your company that you can share with our listeners to say there's a way how to delegate and ultimately we call it in the EOS pla- um, um, terminology is dele- delegate and elevate. You know, So we're not diminishing the experience for our clients, but we're actually elevating it by diversifying the people they could focus on on supporting you right so personally i you know i realized for myself um early on that i enjoy talking to business owners i enjoy the uh, business conversations i don't enjoy sitting on quickbooks and categorizing transactions as you know as funny as it is because i started out as a bookkeeper it was a means to an end meaning i had to categorize the transaction because i wanted to have that report but I was, uh, I, I was, you know, causing a, a lot of uh, stress on my end, being busy with it and also wanting to help the customers. So to me, the first thing was in my head, I want to be able to do the part that I'm good at. And I know that's what the customers want. And the rest should be handled by your team. Now, based on the previous idea that I was uh, talking about, that price is what justifies your cost. I had to think about what my business model will be in order for me to be able to have, you know, that high level of employees that can literally manage the end-to-end uh, bookkeeping where I can come to a report without needing even to review it and know that it's accurate and it's the way I want it and have that conversation with the owner. So that made me look at uh, um, this whole industry as a whole, bookkeeping companies, CFO companies, and, and learn about different uh, business models there are. And uh, ultimately the structure that I went with was to support this idea where I could spend literally, you know, all my time or most of my time with customers, with talking to them, meeting with them, having these CFO conversations, and my team being able to handle um, A to Z in terms of the, the work uh, to be done. So that would be, you know, the number one thing I would tell anybody is you want to be very clear about yourself. Where is your strong point? What's the point that you've been putting into the company that's driving the company forward and the rest? It has to make sense. Figure out a way it should make sense to delegate and uh, that as quickly as possible. 
And it's something that I share also with business owners is if you're the business owner and you start hiring, you get to decide which things you want to uh, delegate, you know, which are the things on top of the list that you want to delegate. Usually it's, it's, it falls into two buckets. Either you're great at it, but you hate doing it. Right. Or you hate doing it and you're not so great at it anyway. <laughs> so you need to give it away. So it's pretty obvious for our business owners when they start delegating is where should the delegation happen? But when, when somebody tells me, uh, you know, I want to hire my first employee, but I don't know what to give them over. It's usually it's usually because they just want control. It's not so much they don't know what to give over, or maybe they're not so they, they need the training as how to delegate. But what to delegate should be pretty obvious in your process. Either things you're totally not good at, or these things that you totally not uh, you you don't want doing. Right, and also also the you know having an overall idea of how your business will move forward. You know. What are the positions that you need and at what point? What's more important, less important? Creating that map, I found it to be extremely helpful for myself because, you know, okay, I got through that next hire. This is the part of the business that I want to set up a system and process for. The guy is, you know, running it. I'm happy with it. Okay, what's the next step? And why is that next step important? Because you always have directions. As you said, you can hire for this, you can hire for that, and you're making that decision. So if you have a very clear business model, a clear structure, and you know what step one, step two, step three, such a map is is very valuable. Beautiful. How can people find out more about you? So you can go onto my website, pennetbookkeeping.com, P-I-N-I-T, bookkeeping. There's a contact uh, button there. You know, you can schedule a call if you want to talk about anything related to finance and your business. There's articles that you can read there, and there's also a weekly newsletter that comes out. So it's my website slash newsletter. You can sign up. I talk specifically to e-commerce sellers, um, but there's general uh, finance ideas there as well. Beautiful. For the links and resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast. Now, for those who did not check out our new Ptex Group website, now with every episode that goes live, we have video, audio, download options, just the synopsis of the show, transcripts of the show. Um, we have the four practical pointers that we usually take out of the episode and some notes and links. So pretty robust for every episode that goes live now. So go out, go, go on the website and check it out. And we'd love to hear your feedback. So you could always chat with us or actually submit any forms. And if you see any bugs on the new website or you feel anything we could improve, to make this a go-to resource for business owners. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'll try. Number one, a book to change your life. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Um, if you're afraid and you know it's the right thing, continue being afraid and still do it. Nice. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently. What I try to do every day. Beautiful. And that's the final question. What's still on your bucket list to achieve? I'm going to take a, you know, the company to a level where I can support a lot more businesses. So part of this conversation is, uh, is you know, hopefully going to help us to reach out to more companies that need the support. That's for now. Beautiful. Pickles, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Thank you. It was fun, fun being on. That's my conversation with Pinchas Engel. My takeaway from this one, number one, identify tasks you are not proficient at or do not enjoy and delegate them to your team. Make a list of tasks to delegate and assign them to team members or outsource as necessary. Number two, implement systems to track and manage inventory and sales data, especially important for e-commerce sellers. Invest in analytic tools and review inventory data weekly to avoid over or under stocking. Number three, for early stage businesses, consider outsourcing bookkeeping and hiring a fractional CFO to manage finances cost effectively. Research and engage a bookkeeping service and fractional CFO to ensure professional financial oversight. Number four, if you're a business owner, objectively assess your financial skills and seek support where needed. Take a financial literacy course or workshop and consider consulting a CFO to get professional audit of your financial strategy. And number five, 
develop a structured business model and a hiring roadmap that involves as your company grows. Draft a business model that includes your long-term goals and a phased hiring plan based on projected growth milestones. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends and if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day. Oh,